Welcome if you are here for the first time. Welcome Baptism Sunday. As Esther said, it is my favorite Sunday. It's good to see you. Welcome if you're here for the first time. If you're here to see someone get baptized later, you're more than welcome here. Um, I've been given the topic baptism. The, message, the title of my message is Passing Through the Waters of Baptism. A timely message for today. And uh, you may remember Matt uh, always speaking on the why. The why is a church. The why we do what we do. And our why is leading people to Jesus. It is a simple message. In our youth, in our youth ministry, we're leading young people to Jesus. In our kids ministry, where our children are, leading kids to Jesus. In our YA ministry, leading young adults to Jesus. That is our why, the what and the how. The what we do, how we do it may change, secondary. But the nucleus, the middle, is the why. And the, and the person we do it for is for him, the why. So my message today is about baptism. It's about the why, why we do what we do. Why baptism? Why this moment of celebration? Why baptism? We're going to unpack the why. This summer, um, I was able to go to Barcelona. I feel very cruel talking about it because we're in October and it's getting cold. If I went to Barcelona, where Chavi's from, and, and one of these days we were on the coast of Costa Brava. If you want to close your eyes, you can imagine it if you'd like, if you, if you want to be taken there. <laughs> we were on Costa Brava and we were on the beach and a group of my friends and, and we swam over to the cliff edges and it was lovely. There was a, like a staircase going up to the cliff um, and I was with all my friends and I'm a bit of a wimp actually um, but I saw my mates climbing underneath the fencing towards the edge of this rock and I, was, I knew what was coming and I was just like oh I'll, I'll stay back I'm just gonna I'm gonna look and then one of them goes oh we could so just jump this into the sea and I'm like no <laughs> no um, and and they kept going forward all of them went forward and they were like yeah we could do this so if you can do this I was like no um, I was actually told not to call it a cliff edge because apparently I was being dramatic apparently it wasn't that high the young people were like stop lying it was a rock but to me it was very very high and as, as we got closer they started jumping in and I was being so dramatic I was absolutely terrified and eventually they, they wouldn't shut up, they wouldn't stop pressuring me, that's peer pressure, don't give in to peer pressure and, um, and I got to this edge and I had to hold my friend's hand and I jumped and I was immersed into this ocean of Costa Brava and it wasn't that bad, I was being dramatic as I jumped off this rock but that gave me an image right, where are we at with Christ are you, are you where I was at, up against this rock edge, absolutely Nowhere near. Are we not even close? Arms crossed, head, head looking over. Are we running away? I believe that there might be people here running away, but God is tugging on the heart to get closer. Are we peering over the edge? Where are we at with God? Are we in relationship with him? You know, this, this journey as a Christian, there's no ultimate destination until we're in eternity, obviously. But, but where are we at on this journey? Are we, are we disciples? Are we, are we followers? Or, or are we running away, but there's a tugging on the heart? Have you passed through the waters of baptism? Is that where you're at this morning? Our key passage comes from Acts 8, verse 26 to 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down to Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way to meet and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. He said, do you understand what you are reading? 
the man said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as lamb because its shearer was silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his, dis- of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The man asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself, someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. The man said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? He gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the man went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the man did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Or passage. With indication of the spirit, Philip was led to meet this man. This man is unnamed, this Ethiopian. We don't hear from him again. He may have called himself a Christ follower. Some people believe that he may have been a Jew because he, he went to Jerusalem to worship. But uh, as it says in Deuteronomy 23, because of, he, he was a eunuch, he didn't have place in the assembly of the Lord. And although this is under question about what this actually meant, it's believed that this man in Jerusalem may have been prevented to enter the assembly of the Lord. This man may have been prevented to worship. So although the situation of this man and he, as he's heading back to Gaza is unknown, it is believed that he may have been, been prevented to worship, to enter into the assembly of the Lord. But this man had access to scripture. He was trusted. He was honored. He was wealthy. He knew the word. He had access to this scripture. He was probably a good man, well-trusted man. But he had never experienced or or had participation in what Jesus had done for him. He said, how can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? He had not yet been fully immersed in the work of Christ. He knew the prophet, he knew the scripture, yet he had not experienced it for himself. But Philip, what a beautiful moment where he is led by the spirit to speak to this man. And he opened his mouth, the scripture said, and told him the good news about Jesus. And for that moment, the moment where something is explained to him, he believed and he was baptized. The moment that everything clicked for him, he had the good news of Jesus. He believed and he was baptized. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which actually means to immerse, to dip, submerge, cleanse, to make clean with water, to be covered over, to overwhelm, to be submerged and immersed. So when someone is baptized, for those of you who'd never seen it before, Someone is is submerged completely under the water and is taken back up in front of witness, in front of other other Christians. That's what a baptism physically, physically looks like. But this act of baptism, this immersion in water, is a powerful symbol and public declaration. Powerful symbol, public declaration. A declaration and an act of faith. Just like this man in this passage, he believed in the good news of Christ that Philip had shared with him and he was baptized. Baptism is powerful symbol and public declaration of faith in Jesus. Before the step of baptism comes the step of faith. In Romans 10 verse 9 it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Declaring with your mouth and believing you are saved. You see, all it requires is faith. This moment of salvation, the moment that comes before baptism is the moment of salvation. The belief, declaring with the mouth, belief in the heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. The belief, the gospel, this good news that Philip had told this man. The gospel that I have sinned, I've missed the mark. That is what sin means, missing the mark. I have done wrong. And the consequence of that is death. Yet God, out of his great love, 
sent his one and only son to be crucified in my place, taking the consequence of sin and all of my sin and all of my guilt and all of my shame, took it upon himself on that cross. And as he hung on that cross, everything that was meant for me was taken up upon Jesus himself. And he died in my place. And he was buried and for three days it stayed silent, as if all hope had been gone. Yet after three days, our Jesus rose back from the dead, defeating death and sin and grave. Our Jesus rose again so we have access to relationship and eternal life with him. This is the good news that Philip had told this man. And salvation comes through believing this, declaring with the mouth, believing with the heart, turning from sin, belief, in Christ. Only then do I have the promise of heaven. Only then am I saved. And here as a church, we we say this salvation prayer. It's part of our culture as a church. This is why we do what we do. Because every week, every week at youth as well, we want to offer invitation for salvation. That is the why we do what we do, leading people to Jesus. We offer and extend invitation to hear. Declare with your mouth, believe with your heart that you are saved. That is the why why we do what we do, salvation. It's a culture that is set on a Sunday, but also for the Monday. For the Monday when when you're in our re-class and people are talking about how you get saved. The, The Monday where you're plastering, decorating someone's home and someone is asking how to come to salvation. A culture that is set on a Sunday, invitation of salvation for the Monday. At that moment, everything changed. Once this man had come into faith, he was saved. And this was the good news of Jesus. So perhaps back to this image. Before the step of baptism, there needs to be the step of faith. Maybe it's a moment of peering over the edge of of, of what is this Jesus. Maybe I need to come to true faith in him. Maybe you need to take that step of salvation. Baptism then is the symbol and public declaration of this faith. Does anyone have a a wedding ring that I can borrow? For a little illustration. I actually asked this in youth on a Friday and everyone looked at me like (laughs) the mistake. I hope not, no. No one's married. Uh, So this wedding ring, for example, is a symbol of a marriage. So if we take um, the vows on a wedding day is the moment that someone is married. In that moment when the vows are made, that is the marriage and the wedding ring is the symbol of the marriage. So just like that, that moment of salvation like the vows is what makes someone a Christian, the moment of salvation, yet the wedding ring is a symbol of that moment. The wedding ring just like baptism is a symbol and declaration of that faith. Thank you. (laughs) Baptism is powerful symbol, public declaration, and baptism is death to life, my favorite part. When we are saved, we are confessing, declaring our belief in Jesus, believing what he has done, but when we are baptized, we are demonstrating and participating in what he has done, participating in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, what we've been seeing this morning. Romans 6, verse 3 to 4, it says, or do, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. Isn't that good news? As we are baptized, as these people are getting baptized this morning, it's a commitment to God, public symbol and declaration, but it's a moment of death and burial of sin, participating with Christ's death and burial as they are under the water They are cleansed from their life of sin, participating in the death, burial of Christ. But if we participate in this death and burial, how will we rise in Christ? As they are risen back out of the waters, they pass through the waters of baptism, they are risen anew with Christ, resurrected new life with Christ. Baptism is death to life. Amen. 
Baptism is full obedience to God. At the end of Matthew, Jesus is speaking to his followers, a group of teenagers, like our teenagers. And his last words to them, the moments, the words that we hang to at the end of chapter 28 of Matthew. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When, he, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to him and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you till the very end of the age. The Great Commission. The last words of Jesus. The words that we hang to. Baptism therefore, is full obedience and fulfillment of great commission. Jesus himself was baptized, not for sinful life or his past, but to show us the way, to show us that true righteousness is in him. The great commission is also command. The last words of Jesus are command. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Matt often challenges, well, how many people have you baptized to, to life group leaders, to team and partnership, uh, partnership nights? How many people have you baptized? So how, how is discipleship going in your life groups, in your ministries, in your workplaces? How are we discipling? You see, what I love about this passage as well, Philip is fulfilling the Great Commission. He is led by the Spirit. This is, this is uh, how we disciple, how we fulfill the Great Commission. He's led by the Spirit. The Spirit ordains a moment between him and this man. Led by the Spirit, and he tells the good news of Jesus. I don't think it gets any simpler. <laughs> Being led by the Spirit and telling the good news of Jesus. The Great Commission is full obedience to God. And discipleship is, is partnering together and doing life together. That's why life groups, we, we say heartbeat of the church. We're doing life together. It's a moment of fellowship, of saying, I'm heading this way, come join me. So maybe in that image, we have stepped into Christ and we need to take others with, with us. We need to come partner with me, come disciple with me. Come, come and partake in the why of leading people to Jesus. The moment of discipleship, fulfilling the great commission. Baptism is powerful symbol. Baptism is death to life. Baptism is full obedience. And baptism is full immersion. My favorite part of this passage is at the end. When, when this Ethiopian man... He clearly had hunger and desire to understand what, what he was reading. And, and once he understood, thanks to Philip sharing the good news, once he understood, it says, what prevents me from being baptized? The word prevents here is koluo in Greek. <laughs> it means, what is hindering me? What is, what is withholding me? What is denying me? What is stopping me? The road that they were traveling was Jerusalem to Gaza. It was a long stretch of desert road. And this, this stream of water that these, these two men were passing was the last stream of water before a long stretch of desert. And this man said, hey, I've heard what Jesus has done for me. What is hindering me from being baptized? For this man, it was a how could I not? How could I not? step into full life, full immersion, full baptism into Christ. It was a how could I not moment. It was a what is preventing me, what is hindering me from stepping into baptism. As I, as I mentioned in the beginning, this man was probably prevented um, acceptance into the assembly of the Lord as he worshipped. But now he's asking, what is preventing me from being baptised is nothing. Where he was once prevented, thanks to our Jesus, nothing is preventing. It was a how could I not moment for him. After what Jesus had done, how could I not? After coming to faith, 
after declaring with my mouth, believing in my heart, how could I not? And to encourage those getting baptized today in this how could I not moment, in this full commitment moment and participation in what God has done to encourage you, this is mighty celebration. This is mighty participation and raising to life with Christ in you. And we as a church, what is our how could I not? As a church, our why is leading people to Jesus. So maybe in that image, it needs to be a stepping into the why, stepping into how could I not? How could I not? partake in this great commission how could I not after what I have heard how could I keep it in how could I not partner how could I not say hey this is where I'm heading to Jesus come with me how could I not and perhaps for you it's a how could I not say yes to this Jesus who gave it all for me that we've been singing this morning as we shared the gospel how could I not say yes to this Jesus. Someone once described baptism as be, uh, the handbrake being taken off in your spiritual journey. You know, when the, when the handbrake's on, the car can kind of work. I have been in a driving lesson where I took off with the, without pulling it off. And it kind of works. It's really bad for the car, but it works, but it's not in full motion. So if baptism is taking the handbrake off of your spiritual journey, it is in full motion, full participation, full life. How could I not? Should we stand, church, before we head into our worship? Perhaps in that image, you've been peering over the edge and there needs to be a step taken this morning. A step of baptism perhaps, immersing into the work of Christ and a public declaration, but perhaps an immersion into Christ, a moment of salvation for you. If this is you, like we do every week, we extend invitation. It's only by faith declaring with the mouth belief in the heart. If this is you, or if you need to make a recommitment to Christ, I invite you to join this prayer with me. We could close our eyes, bow our heads, and we, we say this all together, we never let you do it on your own. If you could repeat after me, dear God, today I take a step and I choose you. I'm sorry for everything I've done wrong and I repent of my sin. Thank you for forgiving me. I believe that you died for me and rose again, giving me relationship and eternal life. I make you Lord and Savior of my life and I commit myself to you. Holy Spirit, fill me now. Amen. Amen.